don't talk, killing time. So who here also stayed up all night to watch the Ted Cruz filibuster? Am I the only one? People like Ted Cruz, representatives like Steve King, governors like Nikki Haley and Rick Perry, people that stand on constitutional liberty, they would not be in office if it was not for organizations like the Tea Party Patriots. Organizations, little tea parties that grew into national movements that are enacting positive change. The entire defund Obamacare movement is entirely grassroots led. And the reason I like the Tea Party Patriots is every single time they send out an email or a speech, they say 100% grassroots 100% of the time. Unfortunately, Jenny Beth Martin was not, was not able to make it today, but her replacement, I guarantee, will satisfy completely. Please join me in welcoming Bill Norton, the director, the National Constitution Education Coordinator for Tea Party Patriots. I used to bite my tongue and hold my breath. Scared to rock the boat. Well, it is great to be here with you today. I know I don't look anything like Jenny Beth. <clears throat> She really, she apologizes that she could not be here today. Um, she's in Washington, D.C. She's still fighting the fight to try to defund uh, Obamacare. So we, we appreciate that. And uh, in a few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening there. But first, I, I like to start out with a story. And, and some of you have probably already heard this before. But uh, it's a fantastic story. If many of you have been to Boston, right? Did you? Did you? Did you take the Freedom Trail when you went to Boston? That red painted line that, that kind of brings you through this self-guided tour through downtown Boston? It's a fanta fantastic place to go visit. And when you start up at one end of the Freedom Trail, you'll start at Breed's Hill, where the Battle of Bunker Hill took place. And then you'll go down a little further and you'll come to the old North Church where the famous two lanterns hung, indicating that the British would be leaving by water rather than by land. And then if you go a little further, you'll come to Paul Revere's home. Now that's an interesting old home because Paul Revere, when he moved into it, it was already over 100 years old. So it's very fascinating to go, go see that home. And you'll go a little further and you'll see some very interesting uh, cemeteries along the way and, and things. And then you'll come to the Old South Church or the Old South Meeting House. Now the Old South Church throughout the 1700s was the tallest and largest building in all of Boston. But now it sits quietly nestled among the towering skyscrapers of busy urban life. But in 1746, during what came to be known as King George's War, it was the tallest and largest building in Boston. And the colonists would gather together there, not only for church, but also for town meetings and things. So in 1746, the colonists had gotten word that the French had sent nearly 100 ships to come and burn the coastal cities of America. Now the colonists were quite concerned because they didn't have the cannon and the guns and the armament and the manpower and things that they needed to fight off this French armada. So they turned to the only weapon that they had, a weapon that they turned to quite often. The governor of Massachusetts declared a universal day of fasting and prayer. On the appointed day, the colonists in Boston gathered together at the Old South Church. Hundreds of people gathered inside, and then they had to gather on the outside and look through the windows because it was so crowded. And it was Reverend Thomas Prince's turn to officiate at that high pulpit in the Old South Church. And he began to pray before hundreds. He said, Oh God, we ask thee to raise thy right hand and scatter the ships of our tormentors and drive them hence. Sink those proud frigates to the bottom of thy deep. And he went on to pray like this for quite some time until all of a sudden the room began to darken. The shutters began to violently slam against the sides of the, of, the, of the church. And the bell atop the tower began to ring erratically. Reverend Prince paused for a moment, raised his hands. O oh God, we hear thee. We hear thy voice, O Lord, we hear it. Thy breath is upon the waters from the eastward. Thy bell tolls for the death of our enemies. Now, how did he know what was going on? He didn't have a cell phone. Okay, yeah, the ships are going down, huh? We didn't have that. He just felt like God was answering their prayers. And sure enough, about a week, week and a half later, the news came that a virtual hurricane had risen out of the Atlantic and had sunk in nearly every one of those French ships. And those that remained limped back to the West Indies from whence they came. Boston wasn't burned. Charleston wasn't burned. New York wasn't burned. God had once again preserved the colonists from utter destruction. Isn't that a great story? Now, I love that story, 
of this event that took place along the Freedom Trail. Because I like to think of what's happening today with this great liberty movement as another journey down a new Freedom Trail. This liberty movement that we call it. I think in the coming years, our, our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will visit sites in which this new Liberty Trail took place. We are in the midst of a great movement, ladies and gentlemen, a fantastic movement, where we are finally influencing much of the dialogue and bringing it back to fundamental principles of liberty, back to constitutionalism, back to the Declaration of Independence. Now, I hesitate to say back because really, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence was the pinnacle of the Enlightenment. And what has happened is the progressives, they call themselves progressives, but they really are the ones that brought us back to the Dark Ages. And we just want to go back to where we can finish with the Enlightenment, where men can be free, where we can excel beyond what mankind has ever even dreamed of or imagined. My daughter, when she was eight years old, she's 12 now, she attended a seminar I was teaching on the Constitution, and afterwards when we were driving home, she said, Daddy, why can't we shoot off fireworks in our own yard? I live in Arizona, and, and back at that time, fireworks were 100% outlawed. And we couldn't have sparklers, nothing. And so she, why can't we shoot off fireworks? And I said, well, government doesn't think we're responsible enough to shoot off fireworks. She said, but Daddy, you shoot off the big fireworks during Constitution Week. And I said, I do. That's, that's true. But I have to get government's per permission to do that. And she said, oh, so they think you're responsible enough to shoot off the big fireworks, but not the little ones in your own yard? I said, yeah, it doesn't make much sense, does it? She said, no. So she keeps asking me questions like this. Daddy, why is government doing this? Why is government doing that? Finally, out of frustration, she said, why don't we just tell government to stop? Eight, eight years old. Isn't that great? Eight years old. I said, well, that would be great, but, but government's gotten a little bit too big and too powerful, and so it's pretty difficult to tell them to just stop. And she thought about that for a moment. She said, oh, like a king. I said, exactly like a king. And she said, oh, no. Don't tell me we have to go through that again. <laughs> So I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, oh, Revolutionary War and all that. And I said, you know, we do have to stand up against our government, but we have tools that we can do so by peaceful means today. We can vote. We can petition our government. We can, we can call our congressmen and senators. We can keep putting on the pressure. And so she was happy to hear that, that we could do it by peaceful means. But if an eight-year-old girl can understand that progressivism has brought us back to the days of a king, back to feudal law, then I don't understand why we can't help Congress understand that they're bringing us back to the days of a king. Now, Tea Party Patriots. So the Tea Party movement, 2009, uh, got its start, right? Rick Santella gave his famous rant, and uh, the Tea Party movement had its birth. And Tea Party Patriots uh, put up a website, and on that first uh, big Tea Party Day, tax day uh, of 2009, we had over 850 uh, groups or events that had registered on our website. And, and now we have well over 3,500. Um, so it's very exciting to see what this movement's doing. And we have totally changed the dialogue in America. Isn't it fantastic to finally be talking about principles of liberty? It's excellent. The progressives have been at this for a hundred years. This year was the 100 year anniversary of the three major events that took place in this nation that absolutely set us on the wrong course and destroyed the checks and balances that were required under federalism. The Federal Reserve, 1913. 16th Amendment, 1913. 17th Amendment, 1913. Those three items absolutely destroyed federalism. And the discussion has been on the progressives dialogue ever since then, and we're changing that now. And it's an exciting time to be involved with that. Now, we've also discovered something interesting. It's not Republicans or Democrats that are the problem. It's both of them that are the problem. Right? 
If you go back, everybody thinks that the Tea Party got its start because we hate Barack Obama. If you really look at the timetable of the movement, the frustration really began with the bailouts under George W. Bush. Right? George Bush started the Tea Party movement. And then you have Barack Obama that continued on with it. But you look at some of the things that George Bush did, the bailouts, right? Now, we think that the NSA story was a big breaking story, but if you remember, go back to George W. Bush. Remember the AT&T NSA wiretappings that were taking place there? Same stuff happening under Barack Obama as well. Remember the, the uh, medical prescription uh, that was expanded under George W. Bush? Of course, Barack brought, brought it up a, no a huge notch with Obamacare and then the IRS scandal and things. So what we're really fighting against is those who love centralized government. And we've got to go back to a, an understanding of self-governance. There's a great story of a man by the name of Captain Levi Preston who served in the Revolutionary War. And he was interviewed by a, uh, by a reporter when he was ab about 80 years old. And that reporter asked him, why did you go fight? Was it the Stamp Act or the tea tax He said, no, 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 I never saw any stamps. I never drank a drop of tea. He said, young man, what we meant in going after those red coats was this. We had always governed ourselves, and we always meant to. They didn't mean us to govern ourselves. And isn't that where we are today? We always mean to govern ourselves, but Washington doesn't mean for us to. Whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they don't mean for us to govern ourselves. So instead, we've got this, this big Obamacare fight right now. Republicans are not willing to stand up and, and, and really defund this thing. Now, what is happening right now in the House? The House is getting ready to vote on a bill tonight that will delay Obamacare for one year. And we hope that that passes. It looks like, like the Republicans are all unified in this. It'll delay it for one year. They figure that if Obama can delay it for his friends for a year, then it should be delayed for all of America for a year. All right. It also repeals the, uh, uh, the surgical instrument uh, uh, tax that's there, so it repeals that. And then it also adds another amendment in there that says if the Senate fails to pass this thing, they've got this separate kind of rider, that at least funds or pays the troops if there is a government shutdown. So that's what's happening right now. And it looks like the Senate is going to pass, or the House is going to pass it. Looks like it's, it's going to happen, no problem, this evening. So we need to put the pressure on our senators to get them to pass it. Stand strong. Those of you who have senators that voted for the cloture uh, to end debate, you need to call them and put the pressure on. Those that live in red states that have Democrat senators, call them and put the pressure on. It's working. The bill that they put forth a couple of weeks ago that was a total sham... Your phone calls is what stopped that. Your phone calls is what's continuing on with this debate in Washington right now. So it is working, and we've got to keep, keep that up and keep that message going. We've also got to let the progressives know that it is not us that hate government. You know, they always tell us we hate government. And I get angry with that because I love government. I love organized limited government. I love a government that follows the rule of law. I love a government that punishes those that take away my freedoms and a government that doesn't have the ability to take away my freedoms. I love that kind of government. It's the progressives that want to go back to a king and go back to the whims of men and don't want to pass budgets and don't want to follow a constitution. It's the progressives that hate government because government restricts them. So we've got to get back to loving the Constitution and loving the Declaration of Independence and starting to speak the, the, uh, the language of self-governance. Benjamin Franklin, when he saw that chair that the President sat on in the Constitutional Convention and saw that sun carved in the back of the chair, he said, I've often wondered if that sun is rising or setting. He said, but now at length, I had the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. America is still that rising sun. It's still there. We still have the ability to be free and to be a light on the hill. And so I give you one last admi admonition, to go forth and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Thank you very much.